well, it's good to come together as believers and worship the Lord. Praise God. His presence is always with us, and we are so thankful for that. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning, if you have them, to Galatians chapter 4. They're also going to put the scriptures on the screen for us, but we've been talking about being sons and daughters of God, and, and for a while, or the last few weeks, we have been focusing on the fact that we have been adopted into the family of God, that he adopted us as his own children. And if you missed last week explaining what that means, what adoption actually means, and why that is so powerful that we've been adopted into God's family, please go back on our website. You can catch up. All of our sermons are online. You can, you can catch up there and listen to them while you're driving, working, cleaning the house, whatever. Uh, they're, they're readily available. But you, you, you really need to understand that one piece to understand everything that we're going to continue talking about because we have been adopted as God's children, and it was a legal decree that God made. And you are not just, you know, a child of God in the sense that, oh, every, all of creation is a child of God. No, that's not. It's more than that. It's more than that. God took you. When you professed faith in Jesus Christ and you became a follower of God, you were adopted into his family as his own child. And you're not some sort of second-rate child, you know, some sort of stepchild or uh, something like that. You are God's child. And that is a powerful truth that is revealed in Scripture. We see this in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, that was Jesus, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. That's you. So that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Amen. So what this passage tells us is that, of course, we know Jesus is the son of God sent into the earth. To die for you and I's sins. But what this passage tells us that because of his death on the cross, you, there was a way made for you to be adopted into the family of God. And Jesus is the heir of all things. In the end, Jesus will receive an inheritance. And, and what this scripture is telling us is that you will also receive that inheritance through adoption. Because you have been made a son through adoption, you are also an heir through adoption. God, the biggest part of our inheritance is eternal life, praise God, and we will receive that. But I want to look this morning, Luke chapter 15, I want to talk to you about the heart of God, the father heart of God towards you, and, and this is one of the best passages in scripture for us to really look at that, Luke chapter 15 verse 1. It's a familiar passage of scripture that many people refer to as the prodigal son. That phrase is not in scripture, that's just a title that you know, man put there. And really, when you look at this scripture, uh, this passage, it really is not about the prodigal son. It's really, it's really not about him at all. The, the, the story is so much bigger than the prodigal son. It's not about him at all. Actually, the story is about two things. The story is about two different reactions to what the prodigal son did. The focus is not on the prodigal son. The focus is on the reaction of the father and the reaction of the older brother to what the prodigal son did. And that's what we we're going to focus on this morning. That's, that's the only way you'll really understand this passage. Now, to, to understand why Jesus even told this story to begin with, I want us to look in verse 1. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to, to hear him, Jesus, and the Pharisees, that was the religious leaders of the time, Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus is seeing this, and the tax collectors, the, when it says tax collectors, it's talking about just scum of the earth. All right, people, they hated the tax collectors because they would extort money from them. When you saw the tax collector come and you ran the other way, they were considered traitors. They were, they were thieves. They stole people. The tax collectors were hated. So there's tax collectors and sinners, and they're drawing near to Jesus. Now, the, the religious people are thinking, 
The tax collectors and the sinners don't want to be around us. They don't want to do, they don't want anything to do with us because we're so holy. And so the, the, if Jesus were truly holy and he were truly a man of God, these sinners and tax collectors, they wouldn't want anything to do with him, yet they're gathering around him. But see, did you know that God sees things a lot differently than you see them? Matter of fact, the Bible says that his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. His ways are higher than your ways. He doesn't see things the way that you see them. When, when God saw sinners and tax collectors gathering around him, it brought joy to his heart. Why? Because it's those people that he came to die for. He, he, when he sees the sinners and the tax collectors coming around, he's not like, oh, get away from me. But that's how the religious leaders were. They were like, man, if you were really holy, you wouldn't want these people around you. You know, we still do that today. You see somebody out in, you know, that's supposed to be a Christian or supposed to be a holy person, supposed to be a, a pastor, a minister, and you see somebody around them that you deem as a sinner or unholy, you go, man, why are they hanging out with them? Man, maybe they have some kind of secret problem I don't know about. Well, maybe they're being like Jesus. Did you ever think about that? Now, I'm not talking about foolishness of, you know, going and participating in the sin. Jesus didn't participate in the sin. But when these, when these people came around him, do you know what happened? When these people came around Jesus, they were healed. They were made whole. They were transformed. But some people say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm like Jesus. I hang out with sinners. Yeah, the difference is you're being transformed to be like them. Jesus transformed them to be like him. The life that he had came off. They wanted what he had, and they were transformed in his presence. So, we're here in verse 1. Now, the tax collectors and sinners, they were all drawing near to him. I love the fact that the tax collectors and the sinners felt comfortable like they could come to Jesus. They didn't feel like they had to, you know, come, come bowing down and hiding their face. No, they felt like they could come to him. There was something about him that drew them. They didn't feel that way about the, religious, the other religious people. They felt judged. They felt ostracized. They felt, you know, like they were not good enough. But with Jesus, they felt like they could come around. So they're upset. They're grumbling. And they said, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Like that was common knowledge. No holy person would do that. Well, they were wrong because that's not how God felt. So Jesus, trying to help them see how God sees it, he told them three stories. We're not going to read all three stories. I'm just going to summarize. They're all found in Luke chapter 15. But he begins three stories. The first one is the, the lost sheep, story of the lost sheep. And he, he looks at him and he says, okay, guys, which of you, if you had 100 sheep and you lost one, wouldn't leave the 99 and go find the one, right? Because that one sheep is valuable to you. That one sheep represents income. It represents money. You're not going to just let that sheep run off and die. He said, you're going to leave the 99 and go find the one sheep. And when you find it, you're going to come back and you're going to call your friends. And you're going to say, hey, man, you know that sheep I told you about? Guess what? I found it. And they're going to go, all right, awesome, man. They're going to rejoice with you. And what's his point? We're talking about a sheep. How hypocritical. If you would leave 99 sheep to go after one, how hypocritical if you care that much about a sheep but when you see a sinner that is far from God, you could care less whether they're lost or not. He said, how hypocritical is that? That's his point. Then he goes on to tell the next story. He says, okay, or what about this? He said, what if there was a woman in the house that had 10 gold coins? And she lost one of the gold coins. What would she do? She would sweep the whole house looking for that one gold coin. And when she found it, uh-oh. Is that the storm or, okay, I know it's supposed to get stormy out. He said when she found the one gold coin, what would she do? Again, she'd call up her friends. She'd post it on Facebook, found my gold coin. <laughs> Yay, smiley face. <laughs> Why? Because she's so happy that she found the gold coin. And, and what's Jesus saying? He's saying, how hypocritical that you would sweep high and low with your flashlight, looking everywhere for the for the piece of money, but when it comes to a human who's lost and far from God, you're totally indifferent. No care, no concern. He says that is not God's heart. That's the opposite of God's heart. 
God cares far more about a human that is lost than a sheep or a gold coin. And so he finally tells this third story, which we call the prodigal son, found in verse 11. Now I want to be clear. This story is not about, and this is where some people miss this, it certainly it applies. Certainly this story applies to someone who's never been saved, they've never received Jesus. That's actually not what this story is about. Neither is the sheep or the coin. If you look at all three stories, particularly the prodigal son, the son was in the father's house. This is not someone that was not a son already. This is not someone that was an orphan, for example. Jesus could have used that example if he'd wanted to represent someone that was totally lost and had never been in the father's family. That's not what he's talking about. The sheep was in the fold, then lost. The coin was in the bag, then lost. The son was in the house, then lost. So what is his point? His point is to communicate how he feels about you as a son. And, and I'm, I'm making that distinction or daughter, I'm making that distinction because many times as believers, we know and understand that when we're lost and we're away from God, of course we were sinners, of course we messed up, of course we made huge mistakes, and of course God loved us and brought us in. But then once we're in the family and we mess up and we make mistakes, we think somehow God's mad at us, God's angry with us, God's going to judge us, God's going to crush us, he's going to condemn us because we knew better and we did it anyway, right? Well, this story is actually not about someone that was outside of the house receiving mercy. This story is about someone who was in the house. They were already a son. They had already had a relationship with the father, but then they still messed up even though they knew better. That's what this story is about. And, and I'm, that's why I'm focusing on this this morning because I don't want you to think, oh, this is, yeah, we know God loves sinners like that, people that are away from God. Listen, God loves you like that. Even when you mess up, even when you make mistakes, God loves you. His, his heart doesn't change for you. Because guess what? Even though you're a child of God, even though you receive salvation, you're still going to make mistakes. You're still going to have problems. You're still going to make boneheaded decisions. And this is God's heart for you when that happens. Listen to this. He said to them, verse 11, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. In other words, my inheritance. I want it now. And so he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. Now remember, these are Jewish people, and pigs are uh, an abomination to them. And this man finds himself feeding pigs as an occupation. He sent him into his fields to feed pigs, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Let's stop right there. So what's going on? Well, the son asks his father to give him his inheritance early. Now, first of all, can you imagine how offensive this would be. What would you do if your 16, 17-year-old child came to you? You spent your whole life getting to a certain place in life. You went to college, paid off your debt, started a business, bought property, saved money, invested, and now your 16, 17-year-old knucklehead comes to you and says, hey, can you just go ahead and split me off my half of the inheritance? I'm going to go off and live. I mean, if it were me, now, I just hadn't been totally redeemed yet. I just had, apparently, I don't have enough of the character of God in me just yet. Because that's not, I wouldn't respond the way the Father did. To think that I'm going to give you half of what I've worked for. Actually, in, this, in the younger man's case, it would have been a third. Because the, the older brother is entitled to a double portion. So he would receive, the older brother would receive two-thirds 
of the inheritance, the younger would receive one-third. But if you think I'm going to take one-third of what I've worked for and I'm going to give it to you, I mean, my first question would be, what about me? You little rascal, what about me? I mean, you want me to just be poor and destitute? I mean, you don't even, you're not even thinking about me. You're just thinking about yourself. So the reaction here, not, not to mention just the, the imprudence of the whole thing, the insult of the whole thing of thinking most people get the inheritance when what? I die. Well, what are you really trying to say here? Do you wish I was dead? You just wish I'd go on and die? What that tells me is in the back of your mind, you're kind of thinking, man, I wish the old man would go ahead and kick the bucket. <laughs> How insulting is that? So he says, I want your stuff, but I really have very little regard for you. So understanding that and thinking about that, when we get to the portion of the story where the son, fine, he gets his inheritance. He goes off into another country and he squanders the whole thing. He wastes it. It's gone. Never to be recovered. Then, right after that, a famine hits. And he's not even able to provide for himself just by going, and get out, going to get a normal job. He squanders everything. Should have been wiser. Should have been smarter. He squanders everything. Famine hits. And the only thing left for him to do is go feed pigs. And he's looking at the trough of slop that's coming into the pigs uh, area. And he's thinking, man, I just wish I could eat a little bit of that. That's a bad place to be in. Now, the Pharisees and the religious people that are listening to the story, and maybe you feel this, right about now, it's starting to rise up in them. And they're thinking, man, serves you right. Serves you right, bud. That's, that's why we tell you to do the thing. That's why we teach you these principles. That's why we tell you to be responsible. That's why we tell you to go to school and get a good job. That's why we tell you all these things. So that, you, because you never know what's coming. Famine might come. Why, you don't want to squander. You don't want to waste. You went and wasted your whole father's inheritance. You wasted it. Then the famine hit. Now you're eating with the pigs, buddy. That's what you deserve. That's what the religious people are thinking. That's where this story is going. But how many you know that's not where this story goes? Jesus had a different reaction in mind of how the Father would act. So what he is doing here now is he is beginning to create a gap. He's beginning to show a gap of how men feel about a situation like this and how God feels. How God would look at a person that has done these things and how men would look, how God would look. He's beginning to create a gap because he wants them to see. You don't see things the way that God does. So the man comes to himself. He's in the trough. He's in the, the field with the pigs. He comes to himself. And he says, okay. And, and he comes to himself meaning he had a revelation. So we might say it like this. He hit rock bottom. He's in the pig slop, looking at the pig food getting ready to eat the pig's food, and he just has an epiphany. He has a revelation. He goes, what have I done? And it hits him for the first time, the full weight of his horrible decision. And he doesn't go back to the father thinking that he's gonna, everything's going to be fine. No, he knows. He, he's had a revelation. He knows things are going to be different. And he says, I have lost, listen to what he thinks, I have lost my status as son. That's what he thinks. I can't go back into the house as a son because I have squandered that and I, I have lost my position as, as son. So he said, I won't go back as a son, but maybe I can go back as a hired servant or a slave. Now, I don't know if there's anything we can really relate this to, but can any of you relate this to your own life of what it would be like to lose the position of son or child in your parents' life and be reduced to a slave or a servant. But in his mind, that's, he's thinking that's what's happened and that's where this is going. Because of his decisions and what he's done, he has lost his position as son. Verse 20. So he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. Not felt judgment. Not felt anger, not felt frustration. What did he feel? Compassion. And then what? 
he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I have lost my status and my position as son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to celebrate. Praise God. Jesus, again, here, is beginning to highlight that gap. He's showing them Look at the difference of how God reacted versus how you reacted. Remember why he's telling this story. Back to verse 1. Because the Pharisees and the religious people, they were grumbling, saying, these sinners just gather about Jesus, and he lets them hang around him. What's the matter with him? He's saying, you are so far off base, I'm not simply tolerating them. I'm not simply just letting them hang around like a little, you know, sick puppy and just tolerating them. He said, no. This represents the Father's heart. When they repent and they come to me, I feel compassion. I run to them. I embrace them. I hug them. I lift them up. I put a robe on them. I put shoes on their feet. I put a ring on their hand, and I feast with them. That is my heart for sinners and for lost people. He's highlighting that gap. He's saying, but you, you would have just kicked him out. You'd have left him in the slop. You wouldn't have thought nothing about it. Now, you'd go search for a sheep or a gold coin... But for your own son, you'd have left them in the pigsty. Because they would have done this to their own kids. That's how they would have treated their own children. And Jesus is saying, your heart is not like the Father's heart. And so when you look at these people and you think, oh, they're sinners. No, God is looking at them saying, please come home. Please come back. And if you will just come back, if you'll just repent, I will, I will restore you as son. I will put the robe on you. I will... I will I will feast with you. That's God's, God's heart. Now, make no mistake. The inheritance is gone. It's squandered in this instance. There are natural consequences for our decisions. Okay, he's not going to get the one-third restored to him. The, the rest, uh, and he even says this at the end of the parable, the rest is the older brothers. No, he's not getting that back. There are natural consequences, but it doesn't change the father's love and the father's heart for him. The father loves him just the same, and he's welcome in the house. But the inheritance is gone. He squandered it. So he's, he's still focusing on that gap. That's the point. Jesus is trying to widen that gap and show them how you feel versus how God feels. So he continues, verse 25, and this is where he really starts honing in on the religious leaders and how they would react. Verse 25. So remember... They're in the house, they're celebrating, they've killed the fattened calf, and as far as the fattened calf goes, you know, that represented a lot of money for them. That was something that they wouldn't have just killed for their family. They'd have, it would have been several families involved in that, and it would have only been a very special occasion like a wedding or something of that nature. They killed the fattened calf, they're celebrating. In verse 25, now the older brother, the older son, was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants, and he asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry. Now remember, the father sees the son for the first time. What, what does he feel? Compassion. The brother hears the news of, this, of, the, of the other son for the first time. What does he feel? Anger. But he was angry and refused to even go in. He hasn't even seen his brother yet. They thought he was dead. He doesn't care. He was angry, refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look. See the, Notice the disrespect even towards the father. Look. These many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. Wow. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son. And I want to focus right there. 
Because when we read this story, we easily see the father's compassion for the prodigal son. But we miss the father's compassion for the self-righteous son. He doesn't rebuke the, the self-righteous son. He doesn't turn and hammer him in the dirt. What does he say? Son. He's still a son as well. He said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And the parable ends. We don't really know what happens with the story of the sheep. Uh, the sheep was found and everybody celebrated. The coin was found, everyone celebrated. But with the prodigal son, it just ends right there with this tension between the older brother and the father. And we don't really know whether there was a resolution or not. And I believe that's on purpose because he's letting the Pharisees know it's on your end. This is your point of decision right here, how you're going to handle this. How are you going to react? And it was on the older brother's end how he had to react here. And this is what's interesting to me. In a sense, both of these sons were estranged from their father. One, because they had pursued wickedness. And one, because they had pursued the right rules and, the, and doing everything the right way. And see, there, people try to get to God in different ways. Some people try to get to God by just going out and living life and throwing caution to the wind and I'm going to enjoy life, I'm going to sin, I'm going to do everything that I can do just to enjoy life. And they're trying to get what they're after. But the, the other son, he tried to get what he was after by being moral and doing everything really by the book and right. And, and he even says to his father, he says, I have never disobeyed your command. Now, if you're a parent... How many know that ain't true? All right. I don't care how good your children are. There ain't one of them that never disobeyed a command. But that's how self-righteous he was. All these years, I never disobeyed your command. Yeah, right. We know you did. And see, that's the Pharisee's mindset, though. We're so holy, we live by the book, we follow the law to the T, we tithe off, of our, off the spices, and we do everything just right. And that's their mindset. But do you notice that Jesus, in this story, the father still loves the older son, even though he was angry. Now, let me just pause here, because I, really I really want to hone this in on us. Because when I read this story, there is absolutely a part of me, and surely there's a part of you. When I read this story, that I kind of go, well, the older son almost had it right. Like, he really almost had a right to be angry, don't you think? I know when we read the story, you, you know how you're supposed to feel. So you, you, know, you don't uh, identify with the older son. But the truth is, if you had been in his shoes, and your brother had gone out and squandered everything, and you had tried to do right and stay home and do all the right stuff, why is he being celebrated for his disobedience? I mean, if you're a parent in here, you, you know that. We don't do that. If, if one child disobeys and they, they're doing wrong, we don't reward their disobedience. And that almost seems what's happening here. So there's, a, there's an element where you almost identify with the older brother and go, this isn't right to, to react that way. And, and I'll just say this. In the book of Hebrews, the Bible tells us that as God's children, it's because he loves us that he disciplines us. And actually what he says is, if you don't have the discipline of the Lord, then you're actually not a son. He says it's because of the discipline of the Lord that you know you are a son. So we don't get the whole story here. We don't know after the fact if there weren't some kind of disciplinary measure. We don't know that. But what we know is that that wasn't the priority, and it wasn't the focus, and it wasn't the first thing that needed to happen. The first thing that needed to happen was compassion embracing, kissing, restoration, that was the first priority. Now, did he, after that, continue to, to, to help him get where he needed to be through, you know, boundaries? And maybe so. 
But see, so many times we have it backwards. What we want to happen first is the boundaries, the discipline, the correction, the, the consequences. And then after that, and if you do all that, and if you go through all that, then we will embrace and restore. But not until you do everything right. But see, that's backwards of how God handles things. This goes for all of your relationships in life in general. I don't know how many married couples don't have this. And so they're fighting and they're at each other's neck constantly because I'm not going to forgive you and I'm not going to restore you. I'm not going to breach this, this gap and this relationship problem until you first change and do what's right. And they'll say things like this, well, I'll forgive you when you change. See, Jesus had it backwards. God had it the other way. Restoration was the priority. Peace, love, embracing was the priority. The consequences and all that can come later, but the priority is restoration. That's his focus. And listen, if you fall away from the Lord, you backslide, you get away from God, never let the enemy lie to you and make you think that God's in heaven and the moment you come back, you're not stepping foot back into this relationship with me until we deal with all the stuff you did and why you did it and take care of that. We're going to first go through that before you're welcome back in this house. That's not how God thinks. If you ever wonder, just go back and read this story right here. God is waiting for your return with arms wide open, waiting to pull you back in. You will be embraced, you will be received, you will be loved. And sure, there'll be some practical things that happen after that to help you. But the first priority is the love of God. Amen. This is how God feels about you constantly. When you read this story and you hear this, I want you to feel and, and sense the love that God has for you. And it's not just love when you make a mistake. Like we see this outpouring of love uh, because he made this huge mistake. But listen, this is how God feels about you constantly. When God sees you get up in the morning and go to the place of prayer to read your Bible, I believe he feels this way. When he sees you get up in the morning and you come in to pray or read the word of God, I believe his, his face lights up and he says, welcome my child, I've been looking forward to you getting up all day. This is how God feels about you all the time. This is how God feels about you when you're driving to work. This is how God feels about you when you're going through your day. God loves his children. He's not focused on your shortcomings and, and your mistakes and everything you're doing wrong. He's not focused on that. Now, he may want to deal with it and talk about it. That's why we come to church, to grow, hear, change, get better. But that's not what he wants to focus on. He just wants you. He just wants your relationship because he loves you and he cares about you. Amen. Amen. I want to leave you with this question as we close this morning. Is there a limit to God's love? Is there a limit to how many times God would have done this for the prodigal son? We read the story in God's reaction, the father's reaction. Because the prodigal son made one big mistake and then he came back and we get God's reaction. But what if this had happened again next year? What if it had happened a year after that? Would there have been a point where the father saw the son coming and instead of running and embracing him would have turned the other way and maybe took the position of the older son? Is there a limit to God's love? I remember... In one of the Gospels, Peter and the other disciples were kind of discussing this question, and he, he, he asked the question, well, you know, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? Is it like seven times in a day? Because that would be a lot. If he did the same thing seven times in a row and I forgive him all seven times, would that be enough? And Jesus looked at him, depending on the translation you read, he said, no, not seven times, 70 times seven times. Well, that's like 490 times. And I don't think 490 is like a magical number, by the way. I think it's, it's, it's kind of a metaphor of saying there's no limit to how many times 
that you, that you should forgive. And do you know why that's crucial for us to understand? Because the Bible teaches very clearly that the way that we forgive others is the way that we will receive forgiveness ourselves. So if there's a limit to how much forgiveness you want to receive, then limit your forgiveness to other people. But if you want unlimited forgiveness, if you want unlimited acceptance, if you want unlimited mercy, then you better sow that into other people's lives. And understand that it's not the heart of God to put a limit on mercy. Now, I understand where people's mind go when you talk like this. They think, well, so when you say that, does that mean I can just go on and, and sin and do whatever I want to do? Absolutely not. That's not what it means. But let me tell you something about sin. It's, it's a huge mistake to think, well, if God's mercy and forgiveness is unlimited, then I can just go out and sin wherever I want, and then I can just repent whenever I want. Let, let, me, let me tell you something about repentance. Repentance is a gift from God, and sin is deceptive. And so don't ever think that, oh, I can just repent any time that I want, because most of the time people are unrepentant, it's because they're blinded and they're deceived and their heart is hard, and in a sense, they're almost unable to repent. And sin can take you so far away from God that you never have that epiphany moment in the pigsty where you wake up and come back to God. You can be so deceived and bound up by sin is so deceptive and destructive that you never want to repent and come back. So when you give yourself over to sin, it's not a matter of would God forgive you if he came back. Yes, he would forgive you if you came back. But some people are so deceived and bound up by sin that they will not come back and repent. And that is the deceptive nature of sin is it blinds you. And it deceives you and it takes you to a place where your heart is not even towards God. And even though he wants to give forgiveness and mercy, you will not come and ask for it and receive it. So we don't play around with sin. We, and, and we could preach a whole other message on the dangers of sin. That's not the focus this morning. The focus is on the love and the mercy and the forgiveness of the Father. Amen. Praise God. Let's stand on our feet this morning.